This happened to me right before last Halloween. I wasn't on good terms with the owner of my apartment. The place is in pretty bad shape, and the fact that the owner refused to fix the issues like the water leaking in the kitchen made me want to look for another place to stay. It didn't take long, and after two days of browsing the internet for the perfect apartment, I found it. Immediately, I called the owner. Hey, I'm interested in the apartment, I told him. Um, yeah, that sounds great. There's only one problem, he told me on the phone. Please don't tell me there's a leaking pipe in the kitchen, I replied. Oh no, nothing like that. I'm actually out of town for a week, but you can come on by and take a look at it, he told me. Fast forward, and after about 15 hours of dealing with the leak in my kitchen, I finally arrived at the new building which I hope didn't have those sorts of problems. As I was standing outside, the building looked deserted. It had three floors, and as I walked up to the third, where the apartment was, I didn't hear any noise, nor did I see anyone. It looked like the entire place was empty. I got to the door, and a sticky note was stuck to it. Call me when you see this. Signed, Todd. That was the owner's name. I called him, and he said that he had reached a decision. Since I wanted to move in right away, he would let me do that. Also, he told me about the whereabouts of the key. It was hidden under the plastic plant that charmingly decorated the seemingly deserted hallway. I took out the key and opened the door. As I made the first step in, I heard a noise coming from the apartment right at the end of the hallway. It sounded like some sort of banging, but I could only hear it for a couple of seconds. I didn't think twice about it. I was too excited to see if this new place is going to be okay, or am I about to start looking for an apartment all over again? I got in, and I wasn't disappointed. Not bad, I said to myself while walking around the house. Yeah, it wasn't anything special, but it was clean, and I had a lot of space. The furniture was okay, and most importantly, everything was dry. No leaking pipes this time. The next day was Halloween, and since I loved the holiday, I decided that I needed to go to the store and get some candy for the kids. But as I took a look at the time, I postponed the trip until the next morning. I was really tired. I had the worst sleep that night. I kept having cold sweats, and I had a feeling that something was lurking outside my door. I even opened it a couple of times to make sure that no one was there. All I felt was a chill as I looked down the hallway, but nothing else. So I blamed it on being in a new place. The next day, I set my new apartment up for Halloween. Candles, cobwebs, and the works. As nighttime came, I was ready for the kids to arrive. I hope I didn't buy all this candy for nothing. I said while I waited with a huge smile on my face, but as the minutes and finally hours went on, I realized that no kid would come and trick or treat in the building. I opened my apartment window to see what was going on outside. Lots of kids, accompanied by their parents, were simply walking past my building. Maybe the fact that I was the only apartment with the light on made them think the place was almost deserted. I went back inside and turned on my TV. I guess it'll be a boring Halloween. I said while changing channels left and right. All of a sudden, I heard someone knocking at my door. Trick or treaters? I said to myself while becoming more and more excited. I got up, grabbed the bowl of candy, put on my plastic devil horns, and opened the door. Hello, I said, but shortly I realized that no one was there. I looked left and right, and there wasn't any sign of trick or treaters. I know I heard someone knocking at my door. I said, while being confused. I got back inside, put the bowl on the table, and sat back on the couch. Again, I heard banging, and of course, full of hope, I went back to the door. Just as the last time, no one was there. But as I looked around, I heard banging coming from the apartment down the hall. So that's what I heard, I said to myself. But a thought popped into my mind. Why don't I go and introduce myself? There was only two people living in the entire building. Why shouldn't we know each other? I said. As I was walking down the hall, I felt it was getting colder and colder. There weren't any windows open or anything like that. I knocked on the door, but no one answered. The banging noise coming from inside. I knocked again. Come on, I know you're home, I said to myself, but no one answered. I decided to try a third time, and if they're still not going to answer me, I would just quit. But before my knuckle touched the wooden door, it opened. 
on its own, apparently. Hello? I said, while standing at the door and looking around. Again, I heard the banging. It seemed to be coming from the bedroom or something. Hello? I'm your neighbor from down the hall, I said, while taking my first step into the apartment. The place was kind of creepy. It was filled with all sorts of photos on the wall. The banging intensified. I walked towards the place where the noise came from. Hello? I asked while knocking on the door. I didn't want to open it right away, but as soon as I knocked, a growling noise scared the shit out of me. What the hell? I thought. I opened the door, and what I saw left me speechless. Right there on the floor was a man, shackled in chains and with a muzzle on. The man had bloodshot eyes, bulging veins on his entire body, and cuts on his arm. Are you okay? I asked without knowing how to react. The man just stared at me and started to bang his head against the wall. That was the banging noise all this time. I tried to get close to him so I could get those chains off his wrists, but as soon as I made two steps forward, I felt an electrical pulse on the top of my head and everything went black. All I remember is waking up in my bed dressed in pajamas. What happened? I asked while getting up. My head hurt tremendously especially at the very top. Then I suddenly remembered the guy in the apartment. I rushed there, opened the door, and there wasn't anyone. The place was completely empty. No photos, no furniture, and especially no people. I hung out there for a while in hopes of finding some clues or something about that guy who looked like he was in so much pain. But as it turned out, the place looked like no one ever lived there. I never knew what I saw exactly. I even called the owner and asked him about that apartment. He said it has always been empty. I don't know if he was lying or not, but one thing was certain. It was the weirdest Halloween night I ever had. I sighed as I went over reports that I had to summarize. It was Halloween and I should have been celebrating like everyone else, wearing stupid costumes that somehow makes everything fun. I glanced down at my corporate clothes and snorted. Hardly Halloween costume. I tuned out the noise coming from the pantry area and continued to work. After about 30 minutes, I stood up to stretch my legs. I groaned as I raised my arms above my head. I rolled my shoulders back and decided to join the rest of my colleagues. It was a Friday and some of us had to stay back at the office. That week the work was crazy. Project deadlines were approaching. If I remember correctly, there were four of us that night. Olivia, myself, David, and Rick. I told Olivia that I would join them in just a minute. I checked the time on my phone, and it was a little after 8. My boyfriend would be getting worried. It was already late. I called him and I moved out of the pantry area so that he could hear me clearly. Hey babe, I smiled. Chris was everything I wished to have in a partner. He loved me and doted on me. He was 26, just two years older than I was. It was nice to have someone who cared for me. I told him that I was still at the office and we were having a little party on our own. He was teasing me not to let any of the other guys touch me when a loud crash sounded. What was that? Chris asked, worried lacing his voice. I was about to tell him that I didn't know what was going on and then another crash sounded and I realized what was happening. Someone's breaking into our office. My mind raced. How was this happening? I crawled under a desk. A pair of boots walked past me and I covered my mouth with trembling fingers. Another pair of boots followed him and they moved towards where everyone was. When they were gone, that's when I realized Chris had been talking to me. He told me to remain calm and stay hidden. He said he had to hang up so he could call the cops. I nodded, then realized he couldn't see me. Okay, I whispered. Someone screamed and I jerked under the desk. I clenched my fists to stop them from shaking. The music was cut off and I could make out some words. Trick or treat, one of the intruders said, laughing. He was holding Olivia with her hair. She was pleading with them to let her go, but they kept on laughing. Both the men wore red-colored face masks. They were going to rob us. Anger rose up in me. I had been working here for over six months, and I happened to like my job. I wasn't going to sit down and let some criminals destroy my workplace. I crawled out from under my table silently, and I rose to my feet. I looked around for anything I could use as a weapon. 
My face landed on the vase by the corner. It was better than nothing. I held it over my head and walked quietly towards them. David and Rick were on their knees while the masked men faced them. One of them had a gun and the other one was holding a knife. My breath came out faster. I could get killed. They had their backs to me, so I still had the element of surprise. Olivia saw me and immediately looked away, trying to not let the bad guys know that I was there. My heart leapt in my throat when Olivia suddenly started speaking with them. Okay, I'm the accounts person here and, and will transfer all the company's funds to you, but you guys first need to tell me the bank details where the amounts will be transferred. We want cash, one of the intruders shouted. Sorry, sir, we're not a bank. We don't have cash here. A diversion. She was trying to create a diversion so I could get close to them. With their attention focused on her, they didn't notice when I crept up behind them. My co-workers saw me approaching with the vase held above my head and quickly diverted their eyes. I crashed the vase on one of the masked men's head quickly. He fell down unconscious. His gun clattered on the floor. The others turned to me and jumped towards me. There was rage in his eyes. He wanted to stab me, but somehow I managed to evade him. David and Rick didn't waste any time and tackled the guy to the floor. Rick punched him hard and knocked him out as well. Then there was silence. While we were still trembling, we all looked at each other with victorious smiles. Little did we know what was about to happen. As we patiently waited for the police to arrive, the guy I knocked out stood up. He moved back a little and cursed, swinging his gun to keep everyone away. He looked at his friend on the floor. As we heard police sirens, the guy's face tightened with fury. He realized there was no escape for him. He looked at me with a scowl. He moved the gun to me and he fired. I couldn't even move my fingers as I went down. I was still alive, but my shoulder hurt like hell. I saw him move over me and point the gun at my head. I swallowed. I was going to die. I braced myself and I gasped when suddenly he fell down. A cop had brought him down. An ambulance was called for me and I was carried to the back when I heard Chris. Samantha! Chris! I sobbed as he came over to me. His hands ran over me, asking why I didn't listen to him and stayed put. I held his hand with my good hand as he rode beside me in the ambulance. I was the only one with a major injury. The doctor told me to stay off work for about a month and my hand was put in a cast. My coworkers came to visit me from time to time during the recovery period, thanking me for being the reason that they were all still alive. Chris hardly let me do anything for myself as he made sure I got better. I resumed work after a month and I never stayed late again. I'm a female, 42, and this is why I can't trust the holiday. My mom and dad adopted me when I was three months old because my birth parents couldn't afford to have a child at the time, which is why they gave me the best shot at a good life. My adoptive parents have been the best parents that I could have asked for. They have done everything for me and still continue to be my support system when things go wrong. I'm grateful for them and I'm glad that they weren't harmed on that night. Halloween was a good time of year for me. I got to spend it with my friends and family. I was able to decorate the house and watch all of the kids in the neighborhood get a good scare from my house. I generally enjoyed being able to sip on apple cider while telling spooky stories to the neighbor's two kids. They were good kids that I babysat when I was home from college. I was home for the weekend so I spent as much time with my parents as I could before I had to go back and finish out the semester. My mom had to make a last minute shopping trip so I opted to go with her. We had been walking down the street for about 45 minutes before I even noticed that people passing by were giving us questionable looks. I continued for another few minutes before I leaned close to my mom. What are they looking at? I asked my mom. They're staring at you, she whispered. Why though? I don't know any of them. I frowned. Don't think too much of it, honey. They probably just confused you for someone else. Uh, probably. I couldn't stop thinking about the weird looks that those people had given me. I was just walking through town with my mom before we had to pass candy out. We grabbed lunch, finished our last minute shopping, and headed home to get ready for the night to begin. The freaking sight that I went home to was bizarre. My dad had been watching the news and saw a picture of me. Apparently I had robbed a bank and shot two people who were in critical condition earlier that week. The thing that baffled me the most was the fact that I'd never done anything illegal in my entire life. The fact that I was wanted for a crime that I didn't commit sent my mom into high alert. 
She started talking about the what-ifs of the situation, and my dad seemed to know what she was talking about. The police showed up at my house, arrested me, and brought me in to ask me questions about the robbings and shootings earlier that week. They did release me, but they told me not to leave town because they'd be back if they had any more questions. My family was livid. The entire thing made me sick to my stomach. I laid down in my room for a while before waking up to hear someone screaming downstairs. I hurried down the staircase to see a girl who looked like me screaming at my parents. She was demanding to know why they didn't take her too. Turns out that I was an identical twin. My parents adopted me after another family had adopted her. I got the better end of the adoption because my parents had money, were educated, and had good careers whereas her parents were drug dealers. She dropped out of high school, skipped college, and became a stripper at some club three cities over. Her parents had told her about me when she was 21. It took her a few years to finally track me down and she stalked me for months after finding me. This girl was committing crimes in my town and people thought it was me all because I didn't know that I had a twin. My twin was on something, some sort of drug. She was angry and finally had enough of my mom begging for her to just leave us alone that she shot her right in my mom's leg. She ran away from the house. I called for help and my mom was taken to the hospital. The police later arrested my sister for attempting to rob a convenience store a few blocks from my house and she was charged for the crime she committed and sentenced with 30 years in prison. She writes me occasionally. She threatens my parents and myself because she still can't let go of the fact that I grew up with a better life. At times, I'm still baffled at the fact that she exists at all. It truly was like a horror movie. I feel bad for her, but it's not something that could have been prevented. It happens, and Halloween isn't my holiday anymore, all because of my insane twin. Holes and pumpkins, spooky things everywhere, darkness and candies. Halloween was here. My best friend Lisa and I went to my uncle's place to spend the holiday there. We've always loved Halloween. We love to play pranks on people and go on adventures. The first kind of adventure was five years ago when we were 13. Lisa, the smart one of us, brought up the topic of walking around dressed as skeletons to scare everyone in town. The looks on everyone's face as they ran for their lives was amazing. I almost burst our bubble from laughing. It was too hard to control. So many adventures followed after that. The walk to the most dreadful mountain, the search for a missing magical bag, and going to a witch's house. Thankfully, there was no witch. It was just some made-up story. Lisa and I had been best friends since kindergarten. She lost her parents after high school, and I've been the only family she could count on. When I said I was visiting my uncle for Halloween, she made me bring her along. High school was memorable for us, and we promised to always be together. Here we were, five years later, and still having fun as always. Even though we were both 24, we still acted like children when it came to Halloween, period. My uncle had been staying alone for two years now, after the death of my aunt. This was my first time visiting him in two years also. He always rejected my pleas for visits. I had to put my foot down this time before he agreed. My uncle looked older than I saw him last, which was expected, but I didn't expect that the hair on his head was almost fully white. I guess the death of my aunt really affected him. We walked in through the door, and the house looked normal, at least from what I could recall. I noticed that all the pictures of my aunt were gone. They used to hang on the walls when she was alive. Did my uncle move on that fast? It didn't matter as long as he was happy. Lisa and I were so excited to spend Halloween in a different place, and we had our plan ready on how we wanted to spend the night. My uncle showed us to our room, and we thanked him before setting up our plans. We were going to be dressed as zombies. The plan was for Lisa to act like she wanted to eat me, and I would play the part of the scared prey. In under two hours, we were done with all the dressing and the makeup that would make it look realistic. I was a fashion-inclined person, 
and knew all about the costumes. I worked in the fashion industry, and it has been a fulfilling job so far. We went out to the street and saw that it was already getting dark. We put our plan in motion. There were a group of guys walking towards us, and they were teenagers. Lisa roared, and I screamed before falling down, attempting to crawl away from her. The guys scattered in different directions, and Lisa and I almost choked on our laughter. It was so funny to see them run like they just witnessed the end of the world. We did the same thing for the people that came out, and we were having so much fun that I didn't want the night to end. Then I saw my uncle far off and whispered to Lisa that we should scare him. He didn't know what we were dressed like since he didn't see us before we left the house. Lisa was a bit hesitant, but I told her that it was fine. When she roared, I screamed and pretended to trip, shouting at my uncle to run. He stopped, frozen in his tracks, before saying, Elizabeth, is that you? Elizabeth was my aunt's name. Was this a joke? Why was he calling her name in the middle of the street? Lisa stopped roaring when my uncle started charging at us. I was confused also. Why wasn't he scared? He reached out where I was and looked at me with so much sorrow in his eyes that my heart broke. Then he rounded up on Lisa. You! That one word held so much anger and hatred. He punched Lisa square in the face and I watched horrified, still on the floor. Lisa fell down and was screaming. Elizabeth, don't worry, I'll save you. My aunt died from a robbery attack. A guy tried to rob her and killed her in the process. Was that what this looked like? I've been told I looked like my aunt a lot. We had the same color of hair and the same green eyes, but my uncle had never commented on it. Was that why he refused my attempts to visit him? Till I insisted that I was coming this Halloween? He straddled Lisa and punched her again. I scrambled to my feet and tried to pull him away. Uncle, it's me, Tia! He didn't respond to my yells for him to stop. He kept on punching Lisa, and I was still screaming at him to stop. Lisa had stopped screaming, and her face was a bloody mess. A couple of guys started to run towards us, probably due to my screams. They managed to pry my uncle off Lisa. Lisa! I shook her awake. She wasn't breathing. I was calling her name and screaming for her to wake up. One of the guys quickly called the ambulance, even as I tried to shake her awake. My uncle was still shouting that he wanted to protect Elizabeth and he would kill anyone that tried to stop him. It took three of them to hold him down. I was crying so hard that I could barely see. When the ambulance finally arrived, they checked Lisa and said that she was dead. It felt like my entire world crumbled. No, I yelled. They said she died from strangulation. My uncle had strangled her to death. At that point, I wanted my uncle dead. I didn't care that he was family. I wanted to make him pay for what he did. Lisa was an orphan, and she was doing so well for herself. For her to suddenly die because of me was not something I was sure I could handle. My uncle went to the court and was found to be going through some weird type of mental illness. I wasn't paying attention when they mentioned it. I was busy staring at him with all the hate that I could muster. He was taken to a facility to undergo treatments. No one paid attention to me when I yelled that he was a murderer. I went back home and tried to adjust to a life without Lisa. It was tough, especially since I kept seeing her face everywhere I went to. She kept calling me to follow her. Maybe one of these days, I would. Maybe the guilt I felt would ease, and then she would forgive me. I don't want to go anywhere, I protested as my friends ordered their outfits online. Jane and Lily didn't even look up from the laptop, and they announced to me that they were ordering a vampire costume for me. My protests were ignored, and I sighed, as I imagined another night out that I will probably not enjoy. Jane and Lily argued that I have no choice but to go out with them. It was Halloween, and I couldn't afford to miss out on anything. We're all roommates, and I wouldn't have had it any different. They're my best friends, and even though we thought choosing different career paths would separate us, it didn't. 
We were all 22 and had our lives together. Getting enough money to afford a nice place wasn't easy, but we pulled through. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and Jane was telling me that once our costumes arrive, we'd hit one of the best bars in town. I just nodded, uninterested. If I had a way to pull out of it, I would. Jane and Lily could be really persuasive when they wanted to be. After about three hours, the delivery arrived, and Lily went to get it. Here's yours, she yelled, and tossed me a bag. I frowned at the contents. Jane ordered me to get changed, and I reluctantly obeyed her. I surveyed myself in the mirror when I was done. It wasn't that bad. The outfit looked good to me. It was a black, skin-tight gown that stopped mid-thigh. I had heeled boots to complement the dressing. It also came with a little red cape and plastic fangs. I rolled my eyes. If I didn't love these girls, I wouldn't be doing all this nonsense. I came out to see that they were already dressed and were waiting for me. Jane was wearing what I could describe as a sexy fairy costume, complete with little wings attached to her back. Lily was dressed like her name, a lily. I admired the fact that they had good taste in fashion, but I wondered why I got a vampire costume. Why am I dressed like a vampire when you guys look like good people? I asked. Because you're the one whose dark mood will show from afar. It's only fair that you dress the part, said Lily. I shook my head and followed them out. I couldn't wait for the night to be over so I could go back to watching more episodes of Game of Thrones. I just started the whole series from the beginning because I enjoyed it the first time. Lily hailed a cab for us, and we headed to our destination. I didn't even know where we were going. I was only following my friends. Here we are, Lily announced, her enthusiasm evident. It was Club 99, and it was popular for having a great time. I saw that people around the club were also dressed in costumes, and I wondered what people saw in Halloween. We got into the bar, and I had to pause to take in the sight. Gyrating bodies everywhere. I spotted a guy dressed as a dragon, kissing a girl dressed as a butterfly. I averted my eyes when his hands started to roam over her body. Uh, guys, I have a bad feeling about this, I said. Jane and Lily told me to loosen up and enjoy the music. They pulled me to the dance floor, and I tried to stop worrying. They were flat out dancing while I just remained there shuffling slowly in something that resembled a dance. Want to bite me, little vampire? I bristled at the pure arrogance in the voice and turned around to give whoever it was a piece of my mind. My retort died when I saw that it was the dragon guy from earlier. Why wouldn't he be with the butterfly girl? He repeated the question and I could smell the alcohol on his breath. I pulled back from him and shook my head, showing disinterest. Oh, come on, he yelled and moved closer to me. Due to the amount of people dancing, I couldn't find a way to move away from him on time. His hands landed on my waist and drew me closer to his hips. I wrenched myself free before contact was made and gave him a slap. Lily grabbed my hand and I followed her. Jane asked if I was all right and I told them that I wanted to go home. When they saw that I was serious, they agreed to it. They wanted to remain at the club, so I left them there and made my way outside. I hugged my body as I tried to look for a cab. It was quite late, some few minutes past nine already, so I wasn't surprised to see that there were hardly any cabs. I decided to walk a little, in hopes that I would get one. Lost, little vampire? The blood in my veins turned to ice, and I refused to turn back. It was the guy from earlier. I quickened my pace and cursed myself for not staying put in front of the club where people could see me. He grabbed my hand behind and pulled me into the alley by the right. I didn't even know it was there. I tried to scream, but he covered my mouth. Teasing me, aren't you? He backed me against the wall and pinned me there with his body. I tried to slap him again, but his other hand caught my hand just in time. His hand caressed my thigh, and my eyes widened. I couldn't scream because his hand was still covering my mouth, so I tried to struggle and break myself free. My attempts were unsuccessful. Even in his drunken state, 
he was still much stronger than I was. His hand moved higher and bunched up my gown. Tears fell from my eyes as I started to get really scared. This couldn't be happening to me. My body started to tremble. His breathing got faster and he was slurring to himself. I couldn't make out his words. When his hand cupped my breast, I yelled behind his hand. There was nothing I could do. I was trapped and no one was ever going to find out. Kathy? I heard Lily say. The dragon guy froze and I took that as an opportunity. I screamed as loudly as I could and I heard footsteps rapidly approaching us. Lily and Jane appeared in the alley and screamed when they saw me. The dragon guy hurriedly left me and ran past Lily and Jane. I crumpled to the floor and started sobbing. Jane hugged me and said that they felt bad I was going home alone and decided to come look for me outside. They saw that I was walking up the street before they lost sight of me. I was still trembling as I thought of the guy's disgusting hands on me. That night, we slept in the same bed with me in the middle. What happened just reinforced my lack of interest in Halloween. We all love holidays. I mean, what's not to love? My mom, for example, loves Christmas. It's her favorite time of year. Every single time, she would surprise us by decorating the entire house with lights and all sorts of things. One year, she even decorated my room while I was sleeping in it. This is how passionate she is about Christmas. My dad, on the other hand, likes basketball season. He also likes the Super Bowl. I mean, these are his holidays of choice. Pretty weird, I know, but who am I to judge? But what about me? Well, I inherited the love of holidays from my mom, especially a particular one. I know what you're thinking, and it's not Christmas. Oh no, I'm a big, big fan of Halloween. Ever since I could remember, it's been my favorite holiday. I would love to dress up as different characters throughout the year. Of course, being a little girl, I would dress up like a princess, but as I got older, my costumes got darker, as I, as expected after all. But there's one particular year. That year changed everything. I got a new perspective and I started seeing Halloween as, well, different. I started seeing it as something that could be dangerous and I always had one eye open ever since. Let me go back about five years. That's when it happened. It was October 30th, one day until Halloween. I was still living with my parents at the time in a cute house in the suburbs, way nicer than the one bedroom apartment I live in now, but I digress. So as I was saying, I was quite young and living with my mom and dad. That particular year, I don't know why, but dad wanted to set up the decorations. I guess mom was busy and he just wanted to help out. I don't know. So he came into my room that afternoon. Jess, he screamed. I got startled. What? I had my headphones on. Or are those too small for you to see? I snarked before laughing. Come on, let's set up the Halloween decorations, he told me. I was surprised, but excited at the same time. Yeah, I'll come down in a sec, I told him before he closed the door. When I got downstairs, he was already looking through the boxes. Where's mom? I asked him while looking around the living room. She's at work. She just got a phone call about a patient or something. My dad responded without taking his eyes off the fake spider web and plastic skulls. My mom was a psychiatrist and still is. She works with all kinds of people, but unfortunately, I couldn't hear any of her stories. You know, doctor-patient confidentiality. But I bet they got pretty interesting. Moving on. Me and my dad were setting up the decorations, and it only took us about two hours. Done, he said with a smile on his face while proudly looking at what he managed to do. To be honest, Mom used to decorate the house and front yard way better, but being his first try, I can say he did an okay job. As we were heading inside to clean ourselves off, a car pulled up in the driveway. It was Mom. I remained behind to greet her, but she didn't get out of the car. I waited a few seconds to see what she was up to, but she just stayed there. I could see her from the living room window. She wasn't on her phone or anything. She was just sitting in her car, looking in front of her. Something didn't look right, so I decided to go out and see if she was okay. Mom, I asked while knocking on her car window. She got startled and looked at me for a second with her big eyes. She then seemed to be snapping out of the state that she was in. 
After that, she proceeded to take off her seatbelt, but instead of getting out, she looked into the back seat for something. Mom, is everything okay? I asked her. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just looking for some papers for work. It's about a patient of mine. After she found the papers, we went inside. Dad was already on the couch watching the game. Me and Mom went to the kitchen. She still had a worried look on her face, but she wasn't going to tell me what went on at the office. Dad came into the kitchen as well. He kissed her and asked her what was going on, but before saying anything, she looked at me and then changed the subject. Anyway, that evening went on as usual. We ate, we made a little chit chat, and then I went to bed. I was so excited that tomorrow was Halloween, but I was kind of worried about mom. Something went on that day and she didn't tell me what. It was around 1 a.m. and I couldn't sleep, so I got out of bed to go to the kitchen and get some water. As I came out of my room, I heard something. My mom and dad were awake. It was strange because usually they were asleep at this hour. But they were talking about something and I couldn't understand, so I went closer to the door. They were talking about what happened at work. I didn't catch the entire conversation, but I heard a patient of hers escape the institute and the police were looking for him. He was supposed to be a violent individual who was declared mentally unstable. After they stopped talking, I got a drink of water and then went to bed. The next day went by so fast that I didn't remember what went on. I was a little too old to go trick-or-treating, so I met up with some friends and we walked around town. As we passed by a park, we heard something. We looked in the direction of the park but saw that it was empty. Only a street lamp with a dying light bulb was making it possible to see anything. We must be imagining things, I told my friend, and we wanted to keep walking. But then we heard something again. It was someone whistling. Hello, I said while wanting to go over there. But my friend Abby grabbed me. Are you crazy? Don't go there, she said. While we were talking, something came running towards us from a bush. It was a man all dressed in white. We all started running, but he managed to grab Abby and they both fell to the ground. And all of my friends were gone. I was the only one who didn't leave Abby behind. I started screaming and calling for anyone, but there wasn't anyone around. Abby was struggling to get the man off of her. The guy was small, probably smaller than my friend, but he was strong. He finally pinned her hands to the ground and started laughing. In a moment of despair, I grabbed a rock from the ground and came up from behind him, hitting him on the back of the head. The guy wouldn't stop laughing. He didn't even flinch, so I hit him again. But this time, he turned around and slapped me across my face making me lose my balance. I fell to the ground. The guy got up and started to come towards me. I got up still holding the rock. He was laughing the entire time, even though the back of his head started to bleed from the blow. As he was walking slowly towards me, Abby started screaming. Leave her alone, she said. But the guy didn't seem to hear. He seemed so focused on me, maybe because I hit him in the head with a rock. Finally, the guy got his hands on me. He was squeezing my hand so hard that I dropped the rock. While this was going on, Abby was calling the cops. She couldn't do anything else. I tried to hit the guy with my feet, but he didn't seem to feel pain. He was just standing there, holding my arms above my head and looking into my eyes while laughing. Finally, I could hear police sirens. He didn't seem to be bothered by them. The police officers told him to let me go, so he finally did. He turned around and started laughing even harder, staring one of them in the eye. Then, out of nowhere, he started running towards him, trying to attack him, but one of his colleagues managed to tase the guy. Me and Abby got home. I told my mom what happened and she started crying. That was her patient, the guy she was supposed to cure, the one who escaped from the institute. Everyone seemed to be in the mood for Halloween already. Halloween was in a week, and it feels like it was already here. All houses were painted black with skulls and pumpkins lying around. And because it could get dangerous around this time of the year, Janet and I decided to return home where we were used to avoid any of the dangerous parts of Halloween. We had been away from home for about two months, enjoying the cool vibes of the summer before our parents decided it was best we come home. You can never tell how the month could go. I don't know why we decided to leave very late as the journey back to our hometown would take about seven hours by road. We both loved road trips, so it felt like the best option to go with, to enjoy the journey back home, and to make enough memories through pictures and videos. Although I am 17 years old, 
Janet, my cousin, is 22, and so my parents could trust that I was going to be fine in her care. Janet was more like a sister to me, the one sister I never had, because I had just one brother, and he was off in another country with his wife and child. He only called once in a while to check up on me. Janet has been that cute older sister who could not leave her younger sister alone for any reason. After about a four hours journey, we decided to rest at a motel. We were both tired and getting a good sleep was not a bad idea even if the motel did not seem well rated online. It was all we could get at the moment. After payment and the likes, we settled in our room, the bed big enough for the two of us. Normally, girls would always just about a lot of people, especially boys, and this night was not an exception. We had barely gotten any sleep when a knife flew into the room, shattering the window into pieces. The knife stood on the bed, the sharp edge almost on Janet's leg. I watched her in shock as the terror on her face increased. Without processing what had just happened, another knife flew into the room, hurting Janet this time. Her hands held the knife in such a way that it injured her, causing her hands to bleed in the process. We both ran into the toilet, catching our breaths and holding each other. The whole of Janet's weight rested on me because of her injury. I tried to tie clothes on her body, but it seemed as though she had a lot of blood already spilling out from her. The door to the hotel room opened with force. I could feel it almost break from the screws that held it. Laughter echoed around the room. Funny thing, the laugh didn't seem like that of those matured. It was tiny yet devilish in all of its nature, which scared Janet and I more. I'm sorry, we should have left earlier or even boarded a plane, Janet said. It's fine, you could have not known. We only need to find a way out of here. We can talk about other things after that. Being sorry is not the next option right now, I answered. Bella, I don't care what happens here. All I know is I love you, I really do, and I want you to be fine always, okay? Do not let anyone steal your shine, okay? She said. I always loved the way she called my name. It had a sweet ring to it. I could taste the feeling every time she called me. It was like a sweet flavor of strawberry and vanilla ice cream mixed together. If she was old enough to be my mother, the whole world would think she was my mom. I loved her just as much as she loves me. How was the hand? Do you need anything? I asked. Even if I do, now is not the right time for that. Like you said, let's focus on getting away from whoever is causing the nuance first, she said, holding onto her palm in pain. Before we knew what was happening, the toilet door was pulled open, and a force pulled us out, causing me to hit my head on the edge on the bed and losing consciousness for a few minutes. I looked around in search of Janet, but she was nowhere near me. The whole room was dark, and I could not see the other parts of the room. But red eyes stared back at me from different corners of the room. I heard a whimper from the left side of the room and immediately rushed to her. Janet was helpless on the floor. As I tried to help her, my hands touched a warm, thick liquid, causing me to bring it to my nose before realizing it was blood flowing right from her head. I screamed, hoping the red eyes that stared blankly at me would help, but they did not move an inch. A small pair of hands pulled me again, but with a large amount of force. I fell on my face again, hitting my head hard on the floor. The light flickered for a second, but I could not even get a glimpse of who the people that were causing all this. It seemed as though these people took Halloween too far. It didn't mean death, just scaring and catching fun. I lay down quietly, hoping I would hear anything from Janet, but there was nothing. Janet cannot be dead. Pack her, one of them who stood close to me said, pointing to Janet's body. I pushed him away from me, making him to fall on his back, but to my surprise, he got up again in a second. With the pain of her death, I yelled, You killed her! I will make you pay for it! Oh, before you make us pay, we would have packed your body as well. The one that I pushed earlier spoke before pointing a gun to my head. Oh, I love Halloween! This is when you can do things like this and not feel bad about it. It's amazing. <laughs> you are a psychopath. You killed Janet, I cried. Oh, such a baby. Another one who was at the other end of the room spoke. I surveyed the room, 
based on the level at which their red eyes were placed. They all seemed to have the same height, which seemed too low to refer to as an adult or crazy teenagers who were just bored or drunk. I tried to move again, hoping the one who stood near me would not notice, but no matter how much I tried, he pressed the gun harder to my head. With no hope left in me, I said my last prayers, thanking God for everything and all I have been so far. Just do it, kill me, and let me stop struggling. You will have blood on your hands anyway. <laughs> oh, you don't want to make us pay anymore? I thought you would be able to hold on to life longer than this, but since it is what you want, I'm glad to offer it to you. Psychopaths, I thought. The light suddenly came on and they all hissed. I look up to at least see their faces before death welcomed me. I never really had a lot of friends growing up. All of my friends, my closest ones more specifically, turned out to be my family. I have two cousins, Andrew and Alex. They're both twins, and they are the exact same age as me, so it's only natural that given the circumstances, we would hang out all day during our childhood. We were all kind of troublemakers. Don't get me wrong, we were good kids, but we also loved a little bit of chaos in our life. You know the saying, boys will be boys. We went on all sorts of different adventures and pulled all kinds of pranks all over town. One time we egged Mrs. Johnson's house during Halloween. It was hilarious. Well, for us at least. I don't think she loved it too much. Other times we would ring doorbells at night and then hide in the bushes. I know it sounds corny, but then we just love that kind of stuff. I remember one year we went over to Mr. Paddock's house. He was the neighborhood grump and Andrew hid a little remote control car in his mailbox. When the grouch came out that morning so he could get his mail, we three from across the street accelerated the car exactly when he opened the little door and it hit him right in the face. It was hilarious. Of course, he destroyed the car right there on the spot while looking around for us, but you know what, it was well worth it. The bottom line was that we would always have fun and we didn't care about the consequences. Another thing we had in common, besides the fact that we loved to play pranks, was Halloween. It was our favorite holiday because it was that only time of year when we would get to scare the most people. But as time went on, we kind of grew out of the pranking phase. We were teenagers at around 16 years old and all the stuff we used to do seemed to us just to be a little too childish. So I'm gonna tell you a story about a Halloween we would never forget for the rest of our lives. I know I definitely won't. It left a mark on me and I still have night terrors even though I'm in my 30s right now. That year, we decided to do something different. Hey man, Andrew told me, I have a friend who could buy us some beer and a pack of cigarettes. I was talking to Alex and he thought we should go to the cemetery, he continued. Yeah, dude, I'm up for it. Are you sure our parents aren't going to see us? I replied, thinking about what my mom would do to me if she caught me not only drinking, but smoking. Come on, don't worry. Who's gonna be there in the middle of the night? All the parents with kids would be out trick-or-treating and our parents would be at home drinking wine and talking about politics or whatever it is they're interested in. Andrew told me, making me feel even more comfortable with the idea. It was sad. We were supposed to go to the cemetery that night and have a little bit of a party. He talked with that friend of his who had a fake ID and sure enough, he got us a case of beer and a pack of cigarettes. Andrew hid them in the bushes behind his house and when nightfall came, he sneaked the goods out of his yard. The streets were packed and there we were, the three of us trying to hide this case of beer under our coat that Alex brought with him. Everyone was out trick-or-treating. We were forced to swerve so we wouldn't bump into a little Hulk or a butterfly who was so full of energy from all the candy she'd eaten that it seemed like she was on batteries. Our main concern was to not drop the case of beer on the ground and thankfully we made it to the cemetery all right. This place looks kind of creepy, doesn't it? I told the twins. Yeah, but good thing no one is out here to bother us. Come on, take a cigarette, Alex told me while reaching the pack over to me. We found a spot right in the back so that absolutely no one would come there. We were sitting on an old tombstone which wasn't marked. The night went on and beer after beer, we got a little bit tipsy. The three of us had a great time. We told jokes and we laughed so hard that our stomachs started to hurt. Alex told us a joke and we burst out laughing, but we could hear something. Instead of three laughs, there were actually four. We immediately stopped and looked around. Did you hear that? I asked them and they nodded while they were focused to see if there was anyone in the cemetery besides us. 
I guess it's the buzz from the beer, Andrew said, and we all started laughing. Again, the laugh could be heard, but it was like it was coming from right behind me. I immediately got up from the tombstone and looked behind me. There was nothing, nothing but an old oak tree. Who's there? You don't want to get your butt beat on Halloween, do you? I said in a threatening manner, but again, someone laughed. Let's get out of here, Alex said, and we all agreed. We started sprinting towards the exit. Ouch, Alex yelled. Andrew and I stopped and we looked behind. There was no sight of his brother. Where are you, man? I asked. In here, I fell, he responded. We saw that next to the pavement, there was a freshly dug up grave without any marking or anything. It was pretty deep, so he needed a little bit of help to get out. Hold on, we got you, Andrew said. Somehow, Alex reached out to our hands and finally managed to get out. As he did, there was a laugh. We turned around and we saw a guy next to the tombstone in the shadows holding a shovel and saying, need to dig two more. Then he started chasing us. We ran as if our lives depended on it. We arrived home and we went straight to my room. That was crazy, I told them and they both nodded. As I looked behind them, out the window, I saw a figure. Hey, what's that? I asked and they both turned around. As soon as they did, out of nowhere, a lightning bolt lit up the sky and the person was at the window. It was the man with a hat over his eyes, yellow teeth and a dirty old shovel in his hand. He tapped on the window. I'll make sure all three of you fit in that grave, he spoke. We yelled and we went into the living room where our parents were. I told my dad and he went outside to check just to see that there was no one out there. Right then and there, we decided that Halloween wasn't for us anymore. Halloween was my favorite holiday of all time. Me and my friend Jason would always, always search for new ways to have interesting costumes. Costumes like Batman and Robin, or Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus. But that particular year, our plans got messed up. It all happened about the month before October 31st. We were already pretty excited and started planning our costumes for that year. Since we were Rick and Morty fans, we decided to dress up as them. I already went to the local costume shops, but I didn't find anything that would resemble the two characters. I did, however, find a white wig that would be Rick's hair. I guess we're going handmade this year, I told Jason. Yeah, but it's going to turn out better than any costume we might have found in these lame stores, Jason told me. As the days went on, I noticed that his behavior started to change. Maybe it was because his parents left for six months. It was something related to work. I don't know exactly where they went, but I knew that Jason was home alone and had to take care of himself. He started acting strange. It was like his head was somewhere else. Each time we would have a conversation, it seemed that he wasn't listening to me. Hey man, are you okay? You know you can tell me, right? I would ask him. Yeah man, I'm fine, don't worry about it. Just feel kind of tired, that's all. Jason said. One evening, he invited me over to his place. We were supposed to play Call of Duty. Not wanting to go empty-handed, I picked up some nachos and sodas. As I got there, I rang the doorbell. Oddly enough, Jason didn't answer. I started knocking on the door. Still, no answer. Where the hell is he? I said while I was preparing to go to his backyard. Maybe I could see him there. But suddenly, the door opened. Hey man, I was in the middle of something. Sorry for that. Come in. He said. I took a look at his face, and it seemed like he'd been crying. His face was puffy and his eyes were red. I asked him again if he's okay, and he's told me that maybe he has some allergies or something. I put the nachos and a soda on the table, and he started up the PlayStation. I gotta use the bathroom real quick. Hang on, he said, before getting up and going to the restroom. As I waited, I poured myself a glass of soda, but there was something that caught my eye. It was a piece of paper under one of the couch cushions. The corner was sticking out. I grabbed it to take a better look. I'm sorry. I want you to know that it's not your fault. That's all I managed to read off of it. The rest were just phrases that were scribbled out. I couldn't make anything out. Jason came into the living room and saw me holding the piece of paper. He looked shocked and somewhat angry. He asked me what I was doing with that, and he told me that it was none of my business. Then he grabbed it out of my hand, folded it, and put it in his pocket. I guess he was right. Maybe it was something personal and I shouldn't have read it. Anyway, we started playing until about 11pm. It's getting late, I think I'm gonna head home, I told him. 
Jason didn't say anything, but he had a look in his eyes. For one second, I felt like he didn't want me to leave. As if he was afraid of being alone or something. But he didn't say anything. Is everything okay? I asked him again while looking at his fearful gaze. But he quickly snapped out of it. Yeah. Come on, how many times are you going to ask me that? He said before walking me to the front door. I went out the door, said goodbye, and told him that we'll talk tomorrow. He didn't respond. He just shut the door slowly. After that day, things began to get colder and colder between us. I didn't see him much. Now that I think about it, I only saw him one time. I think he was taking a chair inside the house. I waved at him, but he just responded with half a smile before going back inside the house. One evening, I even went to his house uninvited. I thought that because we were best friends for such a long time, I could pop in any time I'd like. So, I bought nachos and soda, our favorite snack, and I went over there in hopes of playing some video games with my best friend. But what happened next was really out of character for him. I rang the doorbell several times, as well as trying the front door, which was locked. The first thing that popped into my head was that he's not alright, but that idea quickly disappeared as I saw him looking at me from his bedroom window, standing behind the curtains. I can see you. What's going on? I asked while dropping a bag of nachos on the ground. I'm... busy. We'll talk on Halloween, he said before drawing the shades. I went back home and ate everything by myself. We didn't talk until October 31st. That morning, I tried to call him so we can exchange updates on our costumes. I was Morty, and he was going to dress up as Rick. He didn't answer the phone, so I figured that I would just go over to his place in the evening before we'd go out. The day couldn't pass fast enough. I was so excited to show off my costume. At about 8.30 p.m., I was in front of Jason's front door. Again, I rang the doorbell and knocked afterward, but no response. I started to get pissed off. I knew the code to his garage door, so I decided to enter the house that way. Now what was it? I said while trying to remember it. Three, three, four, one. Yeah, that's it. I thought as the garage door opened. I went in. Jason, it's me. Are you ready? I shouted while looking around the house for him. I went upstairs to his bedroom and to my surprise, he wasn't there. But I did find something. The same piece of paper I started reading some time ago. But now, it had more than two sentences. I'm sorry. I want you to know that it's not your fault. I'm not okay. And I'm sick of this life I'm leaving. I love you both and please continue your lives without me. Again, it's not your fault. You've been amazing, parents. I'm the problem. I love you. The piece of paper fell out of my hands. It looked like a suicide note. Jason! Jason, where are you? I yelled. I started running down the stairs after checking every room. But there was one in which I didn't go. The basement. I stood there in front of the door, my heart beating a thousand times a minute. I wasn't ready to see Jason dead. I slowly opened the door, turned on the light, and saw him. I immediately teared up and went to him, but it was too late. Jason was hanging by a noose tied to a pipe running all the way across the ceiling. His limp body was swinging in front of me, and I was too late to do anything about it. Trick or treat. There was a loud banging on my door after the words. I rolled my eyes and stayed seated, hoping whoever was at the door would go away. Trick or treat. The person yelled again, infuriating me. I grabbed the water gun from my room and went to open the door. It was a little boy dressed in the worst butterfly costume I had ever seen. I sprayed water on him and he ran away, crying and screaming. I felt accomplished and shut my door with a silly smile. I was 24 and lived by myself in the city. I hated holidays, Halloween especially. I just didn't see the point. People got dressed in silly costumes for a day to celebrate what? It was pointless to me. I was content staying at home watching Netflix. There was another knock on the door. I cursed under my breath. Why would these people not leave me alone? The knock came again, urgently. I picked my water gun up and went to open the door. 
I didn't get to see who was at the door because immediately as I opened it, the person rushed past me, making me lose my grip on the water gun. I frowned and I turned to yell at the person. Shh, you have to help me, please. It was a woman and she looked like she'd been crying. Her hair was a mess and her eyes were wide and frightened. She looked like she was in trouble. I groaned inwardly. I was a quiet guy and hardly talked to my neighbors. I didn't want any drama. Look, I don't know you. Whatever's going on with you is, is none of my business. I liked my solitary life and I didn't want any complications. This woman looked like a complication. She broke down in tears, explaining to me that she was running from her husband. He was abusive and would beat her up from time to time. She said that he got violent again and she got scared for her life, so she had to run away. It was then I noticed she was holding her left arm gingerly. After seeing my stare, she explained that he pushed her down the stairs and she landed on her arm, spraining it. I sighed and went over to get her some ice. She sat down on my sofa and I wrapped ice in a towel before handing it over to her. This is still none of my business. You have to go to the police. She shook her head violently. He'll kill me if I ever report him. I proceeded to tell her that it was an empty threat and there was nothing he could do behind bars. I told her she was too young to spend her life in torture. She looked to be in her late 20s. I know you're inside, Susan. We both froze and she whimpered, dropping the ice. Her husband had found her. I was torn. I didn't know whether to hide her or just dump her outside. My door just got kicked open and then Susan and I rushed over to our feet, looking towards the door. A huge man walked in. He pointed at Susan and ordered her to follow him. She stubbornly refused and moved behind me. Her breasts were shaky and I swore I could hear her heart beating faster. This man looked at me with eyes full of rage. I raised my hands and I told him to calm down. He was a really big guy and I was sure he would put me down if given the chance. So it's you who has made her this confident. I opened my mouth in shock, explaining that I'd just met her for the first time and had no idea who she was. He shook his head disbelievingly and told Susan to follow him again. As she stayed where she was, he walked towards us and I tried to walk away from his path. Susan's hand clutched my shirt and prevented me from moving. I knew he'd probably hit her when he got her back and I got angry. Some people were sadists. She isn't your property. You can't just order her around. The man paused. What did you say? I swallowed at the look of his face and heard a commotion in my front door. About two kids were standing on my porch, each of them in costumes. They were little, couldn't be more than 10 years. They clapped their hands together, looking entertained. They thought we were putting on a show. In the time I was distracted, Susan's husband had closed in on us. He punched me in the stomach and I grunted, <clears throat> bending over in pain. I drove my shoulder into his middle, but couldn't manage to make him fall down. He brought up his hands and banged me on my back. My breath left me in a whoosh and I fell down wheezing. Call the cops, I yelled at Susan. She was trembling and I felt sorry for her. If this was the kind of torture she experienced, no wonder she was such a mess. He kicked me and the kids outside started cheering at Susan's husband, like it was a no holds barred WWE match going on. I lay on the floor trying to recover from the blows. I wanted to call the police, but my phone was out of my reach. I heard a scream and looked up. Susan was being yanked by her hair and her husband sneered in her face. The kids paused the cheering. Now they were starting to look scared. This is real, get help, quick. Their tiny feet ran down my porch and I wish they found help soon. Susan's husband dragged her by the hair and was talking to her outside. I stood up, still huffing, and my eyes fell on the water gun call it a reflex or my stupidity. I sprayed water on his back. He looked at me and raged like a monster. He ran towards me, leaving Susan. Susan fell down and held her head crying. I sprayed him in his eyes and he yelled as the water disturbed his vision. I kicked him between the legs and he went down, <gasps> face contorted in pain. I heard footsteps out my house and I looked up. A small and heavy man rushed in and surveyed the situation. Behind them were the children that I asked to get help. I looked at them with utter disappointment. This is what they brought me? To my surprise, this man sat on Susan's husband and he was unable to move. I sighed in relief. I called the police and they arrived soon. After calming Susan down, she narrated everything she had been through with her husband and promised to testify against him in court. 
I was given analgesic for the pain I felt and also told to get enough rest. Susan joined a support group for abused women and they helped her get over her ordeal. I checked on her from time to time. My experience made me despise Halloween even more, but also changed me a bit. I started a blog and channeled it towards helping people who needed help to voice out before it was too late. Pause. He was my best friend in the entire world. I got him when I was only eight years old, so basically, I grew up with him. He'd accompany me everywhere. Each time I would go to the local store, he would be right there beside me. Each time I would study for some test, he would sit quietly next to my desk, keeping me company. He was the best. But one day, a week before Halloween, he disappeared. But sometime before the disappearance of Paws, a major change happened in the neighborhood. And by major change, I mean that a new family moved in. They occupied Adam's old house. The Adams were an old couple who died in their sleep, apparently. And because of that unfortunate incident, the house remained empty for some time. But this family didn't seem to care, or maybe the realtor didn't tell them. The weird thing was that they moved in the middle of the night. Everyone was asleep that night on the block, except me. Me and Paws were up. As soon as the moving van arrived in front of their house and the brake squeaked as it stopped, Paws got up and went to the window to see what was happening. Normally, he wouldn't do that, no matter what he would hear. But that time, it seemed like he was really curious. Who's there, boy? I asked him while I paused the movie and joined him next to the window. The movers were carrying a few boxes inside the house, and before I knew it, they were gone. It seemed like the new family didn't have a lot of stuff. Shortly after that, they arrived. Me and Paws watched from behind the shades. He seemed nervous, quietly growling at them. What's wrong, Paws? I asked him before I petted the dog on the head. That seemed to calm him down. The new family had a black car. A man got out first. He had a mustache, a black hat, and a cane. Then his presumable wife stepped out of the vehicle. She seemed to be looking around as if checking if someone saw them. She looked sick, had pale skin and really skinny arms. After looking around, she reached onto the back seat and pulled out a cat, a black cat, which she started to pet before going inside. See, Paws, maybe you can be friends with that weird cat, I said jokingly before going back to bed and unpausing my movie. But my dog kept staring out the window, even after the couple and their cat went inside the house. What are you still doing there? I asked. Come on into bed, I told him, and after a few seconds, that's what he did. The next day, as I woke up, I didn't see Paws next to me in bed. I got up and went downstairs. He wasn't there either. Hey, did you see Paws? I asked my dad, but he said he didn't. He thought he was in my room. Mom even put out a bowl of dog food in the kitchen, but he didn't touch it. Paws? Paws? I started to say this while I went outside the house looking for him. I was desperate. He never disappeared like that, and I was certain that something must have happened to him. Paws? Where are you? I yelled. Seeing that I can't find him, not even at the park, not even in the backyard, I decided to ask the neighbors. Hello, Mrs. Davies. Did you happen to see Paws today? I asked my next door neighbor, but to my disappointment, she didn't. I went further down the block and then back again on the other side, asking all the neighbors, but no one had a clue where my dog was. I was desperate. There was only one more house to go, the house where the new family just moved in the night before. I knocked on the door, but no one answered. Come on, I said while knocking again, but this time the door opened. Yes? The woman greeted me with a frown on her face and her cat in her arms. Excuse me, have you seen my dog Paws? I asked her, showing her a picture of Paws. Why would I know where your dog is? Probably out and about, eating garbage and sniffing other dogs. Disgusting, the woman said while petting her cat. I noticed that her cat had a paw wrapped up, and it didn't have it the night before. What happened to your cat? I asked her. Wouldn't you like to know? The woman said before shutting the door in my face. I left her porch, disappointed, and went inside. A week passed, and Halloween night came along. 
Still, without my best friend, I couldn't enjoy it. I wasn't in the mood to give out candy or go to any parties. I kept thinking about what happened to Paws and whether he was still alive. As I was looking out the window, I saw that everyone was outside enjoying themselves. Everyone, except that weird family who just moved in. Paws never ran away before they came, and he never was so aggressive about anyone, I thought to myself. Maybe that woman has something to do with Paws' disappearance, I said. So right then and there, I wanted to investigate. I went outside, put on a costume, and went into their backyard. I was looking for any type of clues that would tie them to my missing dog. As I was walking on the grass, I caught a glimpse of something in the window. The woman was standing on the floor with some candles around her and it looked like she was talking, but no one was there with her. All of a sudden, she threw some sort of powder in the air and opened her eyes. I ducked down. What's wrong with these people? I thought to myself. As I got up, I heard, Hey, stop it right there! I froze, looking left and right. I saw that the husband was walking towards me with the help of his cane. I took my mask off. Hello, sir. I I'm your neighbor. I was looking for my dog, I said. Inside my house? What did you see exactly? He menacingly asked while raising his cane as if he was about to hit me. Come on, dear. He's just a kid. The voice of his wife could be heard. I turned around, and there she was with the window open. I'm sure you'll find your dog really soon. I have a hunch, she said. I looked at both of them, but didn't say anything. There was something clearly wrong with their energy, so I just left. I got home, disappointed, and went to bed. I just wanted to sleep and forget about everything. But something woke me up at around 3 a.m., it was a noise coming from my window, but I was on the first floor. I got up to check it out, and when I did, I tripped on something and fell. What the hell? I said while getting up, holding my head with my hands. But what I saw made me forget about the pain. There he was, paws, right next to my bed as he would normally be. But this time, he wasn't breathing. Paws was dead, all stiff and he had a strange red marking on his forehead. It looked like some sort of pentagram or something. The next thing I did was go to my neighbor's house at that hour. I banged on the door furiously until one of them answered me. How did you know I'll find my dog? Did you kill him? Did he hurt your cat and you killed him and then returned him to me, huh? I yelled so loudly, half the block woke up. You better go back to your home before I call the police, young man. The man said, and he was right. There wasn't any evidence that pointed to them. I got home, and on that Halloween night at 3.30 a.m., I was burying my dead dog in my backyard, tears falling on his corpse. This isn't over, I whispered while throwing dirt on paws.